most generations share in the historical narcissism that they are, in fact, the final generation, that the world is coming to an end, and quickly, within their lifetime at least, it's as if every generation feels that it's entitled to nothing short of the apocalypse. And yet, grass grows in the cheeks of each and every proclaimer of doom, prognosticator of the end, and apocalyptic prophet. But I will admit that there are some generations that a sense of impending doom is more or less reasonable given their historical circumstances. Honestly, for some time periods, it seems to be a very reasonable and reasonably widespread belief that the world was coming to a horrifying conclusion. Indeed, the year 536 has been declared by historian Michael McCormick to be the worst year in history for the West, and even for China for that matter. The 20th century saw the rise of atomic weaponry, chemical and biological warfare, and the contest between the world powers willing to use them to annihilate millions of people. But the 14th century is another viable candidate for a horrible century, at least in Western Europe. The Great Famine of 1315 through 17 would give way to the Black Death, killing up to a third of the population of Western Europe. The religious world would be racked by papal schisms. The horrifying attempts by the Inquisition to stamp out heresy, there were widespread peasants, rebellions that threatened to turn the entire feudal world upside down, all the while the first phase of the Hundred Years' War was breaking out and ravaging France and England. Into what Hegel has, I think, very rightly called the butcher bench, the slaughter bench of history, a Catalan Franciscan issued dire predictions about the rise of the Antichrist and the impending millennium. However, unlike so many other prophets of doom who foretold the great sufferings of the righteous during these apocalyptic tribulations, John of Rupasitia offered a rare glimpse of hope. Rather than merely having to endure the torments to come, the righteous could study the divinely composed book of nature to discover secrets by which to actively combat the power of the Antichrist, secret medicines to heal sickness and injury, radically preserving and making life all the longer, and even the means to create precious metals to restock the plundered coffers of the saints, otherwise looted and bespoiled by the forces of Antichrist. For John of Rupasitia, the key to defeating the forces of satanic evil in creating a utopian millennium were to be found in the very wisdom of prophecy and in the art of alchemy. Let's explore the apocalyptic prophecy and alchemical secrets of John of Rupasitia. Now, if you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, like this episode, Kabbalah, or the history of the occult, make sure to subscribe here to Esoterica. Also, check out my other content on topics in esotericism, including curated playlists on a range of sources. Also, if you want to support my work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics in the history of esotericism here on YouTube for free, I'd hope you consider supporting my work over at my Patreon with a one-time donation with the super thanks option you can see beneath the video, or by picking up some of the cool channel merch that you can find over on the store tab. You can also check out our recent collection of antiquarian rare books and artifacts over at my website. But now let's turn to the apocalyptic war against the Antichrist using the weapons of prophecy and alchemy. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge and welcome to Esoterica where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. As I mentioned in the introduction, the European world of the 14th century was simply one of tumult. And this was precisely the time period when Christian thinking about the events of the last things, the eschaton, the end of the world, were themselves also undergoing pretty radical transformations. Now, for centuries prior to this period, 
the influence of Augustine had basically put the kibosh on speculations about the apocalypse. Augustine really leaned to the idea that no one really knows when it's going to happen and we should be focusing on being good in this life and not the end of the world. Indeed, earlier speculations about the end of the world tended to place the great period of peace actually prior to the rise of the Antichrist under the aegis of a benevolent world emperor rather than in the period after the period of the tribulation, the so-called millennial period between the tribulation and the final judgment, which was often sometimes just as short as 45 days in the literature of this period. However, the medieval period would see a profound shift in both speculation about precisely when and how the apocalypse would unfold, but also a shift of when the period of the millennial peace would occur again, now shifted after the defeat of the Antichrist and ultimately extended, as we'll see in this episode, to pretty close to a thousand year millennial reign, hence the term. But the nigh apocalyptic tumult of the 14th century made a certain bit of sense for a newly born mendicant order. Our friends, the Franciscans. But especially among a radical fraction of that order, those that came to heretically embrace radical apostolic poverty and thus ended up facing the wrath of the Inquisition. The increasing calamities of the times were interpreted under an apocalyptic system generated a few generations before them by Joachim of Fior. Now, greatly simplifying his system or systems, he seems to have changed his mind. There seem to be several overlapping systems all at once. Joachim saw history as divided into three distinct but overlapping epochs. The period of the Father, which roughly is the pre-Jesus time of the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. The period of the Son, between the coming of God in the flesh and roughly 1260. And the period of the Spirit, the kind of final act wherein the order of the just, composed of contemplatives and preachers, would supersede the worldly institutional church. You can see how that's going to get them into some trouble. Indeed, it's during this final period that a kind of mystical insight will fall upon all of the righteous before final combat with the Antichrist and some version of the utopian millennium. Now, while Joachim did tend away from precise predictions about the end of the world, his followers saw in the Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick II, the, I don't know, the budding Antichrist. But then he, he inconveniently died in 1260. So new dates were drawn up in 1290, 1335, and later on still, we're still kicking that can down, down the road. Regardless of getting the win of the apocalypse correct, what did become clear to the followers of Joachim was that one, the age of the spirit had definitely begun, two, Antichrist was imminent and was going to appear soon, and three, the Franciscans, especially the persecuted spirituals and their Beguine followers, were the order of the just proclaimed by Joachim, and they would lead the church in those final apocalyptic days. Again, narcissism when you think it's going to be your generation that will be the last one, but real narcissism when it's your order that will be the last thing to go. And it was into this matrix of spiritual reform, apocalyptic incitement, and several nightmarish decades of the 14th century, along with a heavy dose of prophetic frenzy, that John of Rubicitia would develop his own combination of apocalyptic speculation. And the alchemy, the alchemy meant to not only endure the onslaught of the Antichrist, but to bankroll the construction of that utopian millennium. You can't build a utopia with no money. And as for John, as we'll see, we don't know much about him. Nothing is known about his early life. But sometime around 1310, we learned that he studied uh, for around five years in Toulouse, starting in around 1332. But he found the academic world spiritually sterile and basically philosophers and theologians just bantering around a bunch of nonsense. I hate to tell you, John, it hasn't changed much. Now, it's here that he probably became acquainted with the more radical fractions of the Franciscans, who were especially active in that region, along with the Inquisition, along with the prophetic structures and writings of folks like Joachim of Fior and the practice of alchemy. We then later find him in a Minorite monastery sometime in Rulac around 1340 to 1344, and it would be in 1344 that he would find himself basically in and out of prison or other forms of house arrest or sometimes of institutional custodialship 
for the rest of his life, the next 20 years of his life to the very end of his life, he's just in and out of various kinds of dungeons and prisons and house arrest. Now, we don't know why he was first imprisoned. It seems possible that his prophetic proclamations, especially those critical of the institutional church or him siding with the spiritual Franciscans or their Beguine counterparts, that could have that could have all led to him being arrested. But he doesn't appear to actually have written down his prophetic works until after he was imprisoned. So maybe he was preaching them or teaching them and this ultimately got him pinched. So it's confusing. However, he did have visions prior to his imprisonment, which he was actually kind of skeptical of at first, especially one in which he saw the Antichrist. The Antichrist is a big theme this episode. He saw the Antichrist as a child in a far off city that he only knew as Zaton. Apparently, he didn't make much of this dream until a local bishop informed him that Zaton was a real place. It existed. In fact, it was the Arabic name of the coastal Chinese city of Guangzhou, which very much put wind in his sails. I mean, he had a dream about a city and turns out it was real in China. So we don't know why he was first in prison. Further, the conditions of his imprisonment are often just as perplexing. In some cases, he seems to have been cast in chains into the most stereotypical kinds of medieval dungeons. And in other cases, he pretty clearly has access to reams of expensive parchment and writing materials. His alchemical equipment also seems to probably be there with him at some point. And his writings on both topics, uh, they all easily travel out of his confinement. They, he writes and he's able to disseminate this stuff out of prison. Now, if the church wanted to shut him up, they clearly weren't trying especially hard. I mean, this was a period of extreme activity by the Inquisition, and having, I don't know, spiritual Franciscans burned alive was just kind of what you did on... That was just like a Tuesday. So, if they wanted to shut him up, they weren't really trying that hard. So, we're faced with a number of perplexing practical elements of John's life and his imprisonment and the production of his writings and his alchemy. He would eventually defend himself before the Pope at Avignon, and failing to detect any heresy in his positions, he wasn't a heretic. He was again remanded to some kind of custodial detention, probably house arrest in Avignon, where he was declared a fantasticus rather than a heretic. Maybe this is something akin to not guilty by reason of insanity, but we don't, we don't know. His last appearance in the historical record is around December of 1365. In all, five of his prophetic books survive, along with two alchemical tracts, many of which were both disseminated widely. They were widely translated into various vernacular languages. They were profoundly corrupted in transmission before being very influential both theologically and alchemically. And that's all before their further influence, starting with printing in the 16th century. So. Let me just say something briefly about the problem of recovering John's original works, especially his alchemical titles. As I mentioned a moment ago, his work did prove enormously unpopular, sometimes because it was confused with the work of Romando Law, but and Romando Law didn't write that stuff any whatever. In the centuries after his death, as is often the case with enigmatic texts, and well, prophecy and alchemy are nothing if not enigmatic. Later copyists, theologians, and technicians are often doing as much interpreting those works and interpolating their own interpretation into those texts as they are just straight translating them. And by trying to clarify the meaning of the text, or frankly trying to fix what they think is a corrupt text in front of them, they very often remove us from the original autograph as much as they give us an insight into what John wrote in the first place. And that's assuming that John ever produced a singular, polished, fair copy of those texts to begin with. But using some fancy pants, sophisticated codicological analysis, we can forensically see genealogical relationships between various manuscripts, and at least through a glass darkly reach back as far as possible to the Ur text or texts of John. In fact, Professor Lawrence Principe is doing just that work with John's alchemical text of the Liber Lucis. And not only that, he's doing what kind of makes him awesome and famous. He's forensically reproducing John's alchemy in a modern lab to step-by-step -step check the manuscript history, but also to better understand the world of actual practiced historical alchemy. 
you got to make sure to check out my conversation with Professor Principe. i got to be honest, he's kind of an intellectual hero of mine. And check out that video. It was a real honor to have an in-depth conversation with him about John and alchemy and his own interests. Check it out. But to understand John's alchemy, we first have to understand his vision of the end of the world. In his Vademecum in Tribulatone, finished sometime around 1356, his most important work of prophecy, John argues that the Antichrist would emerge sometime between 1365 and 1370. In that whole decade around then would just be a complete horrifying nightmare. All of secular and religious feudal society would be convulsed. Avignon itself would have to be abandoned by the clergy by July 15th, 1362. Indeed, the whole relationship of predator to prey would be inverted during the apocalypse. Giant worms would rise from the earth and they would eat entire bears and lions. Larks would devour hawks. Princes and nobles would fall before the swords of peasants, dogs and cats. That's the wrong thing. And if a massive French peasant revolt didn't happen in 1358, John's like, told you so, bro. Large-scale wars would also occur. There would be an alliance of Eastern Turks and Tartars and Saracens and who would invade Italy, Germany, Poland, and Hungary. Two, two antichrists would appear. There would be an Eastern antichrist that would uh, deceive the Jews, while the Western antichrist would become the Holy Roman Emperor for three and a half years or so until around 1370. All the while, the cities of Europe would fall victim to war and plague and famine and earthquake and all kinds of diseases, including a weird choking epidemic. You know, normal apocalypse stuff. However, it's not all doom and gloom for John. Two Franciscan friars, probably the two witnesses of the apocalypse of John, would lead the charge against the forces of the infidel armies and the Antichrist. Uh, antichrists. Remember, there are two. There would be an angelic pope who would come along, a secular repairer or restaurateur, would radically purify and reform the church, and the last world emperor, a secular French ruler, would lead the final assault against the antichrists. Following that final defeat of worldly evil, secular and religious powers will combine to spread true Christianity into the farthest regions of the East. They would heal the schisms between the Eastern and Western Church. The Gilfs and the Ghibellines would finally get along, because that's the most difficult thing to imagine in the Middle Ages, before a period of peace would be established to await the resurrection of the dead and JC coming back for that final judgment business. For John, that would be something like a literal 1,000 year period, breaking with centuries of previous prophetic interpretation. Get this, he even argues on Wacomite lines that he knows better than Augustine because he's living in the period of the Holy Spirit. Remember, that generation would be much imbued with a mystical understanding precisely because of their living in such proximity to the final days of the apocalypse. He knows better than Augustine. And while that period will be utopian, many feudal social structures would persist, marriage would continue, a reformed vision of secular and religious power would completely endure. It's just like Middle Ages 2.0 and the millennium. Of course, basically everyone would convert to Christianity. John even has a weird pride of place for converted Jews in his apocalypse, but all the Muslims are going to get wiped out, basically. So widespread genocide against the Muslims. Finally, the age of the Holy Spirit would flourish during this period with the whole world actually gaining a kind of more direct mystical connection to the divine before the mopping up actions by Jesus to bring this whole soap opera of existence to a, I don't know, a final conclusion. Thank goodness. Now, again, this is all pretty normal apocalypse stuff, whatever that means, normal apocalypse stuff. But a couple things are worth mentioning here that stand out. The first is that John doesn't see himself as a prophet. That's a little surprising, I know, but he actually refuses that language of prophecy. For him, prophets are literally people who act as spokespersons for the divine, often as a result of some kind of direct revelation and divine charge, God saying to people, go say this to so-and-so. And while he has had mystical experiences that are bordering on prophecy, he prefers to relate that God has opened his intellect or understanding to a kind of mystical scriptural hermeneutic. 
he's simply able to read the Bible to unlock these mysteries more so than anyone before him, probably again because of his position in the period of the Holy Spirit and that Wakamite way of thinking about time. Thus, he calls his prophecies intellectus spiritualis, or spiritual understandings, and actually denotes them as such in the book as understanding number one, understanding number two, and so on. Now, this is also a, probably a pretty solid hedge against being accused of heresy, precisely because he can claim, I don't know, plausible deniability when, one, he inevitably gets asked about this by the Inquisition. Is God speaking directly to him like a I don't know, Hebrew Bible prophet, and two, when his predictions as they were, don't they don't come true. Yeah, they were just my understandings, guys. They weren't prophecy. So all the more mystical aspects are kind of vouchsafed, the more prophetic aspects are actually just merely his understandings, and all of that explains any failures or misunderstandings that might need, uh, you know, correction before the Inquisition shows up. And, toasts him. Secondly, John's vision of the end is rather more dynamic than most visions of the apocalypse, both prior to him and kind of since him in some ways. In most versions of this apocalyptic story, human beings are just basically, they're kind of along for the ride. It's a pretty rocky ride, but we're not really playing much of an active role in shaping the outcomes of the future events. Now, that's actually a kind of feature and not a bug of apocalyptic thinking, at least according to most scholars of apocalypticism. Yes, it's all going to be real terrible for a while. Giant worms are going to eat everybody. But God is completely in control. Everything is part of the divine plan, and the good guys are going to triumph in the end. It's knowing what's coming that even allows the righteous to steal themselves with a kind of apocalyptic stoicism to face the tribulations that are coming. John's apocalypse is, how might we say? It's more interactive. Human agency plays a rather significant role in the entire of unfolding of the events. Now, the, the big parts we don't get to control, but kind of everything in the middle we do. Kind of Dungeons and dragons in that way. In fact, he even urges the readers of his text to to hide dried food and even weapons in caves so they can go in there and hide and defend themselves during the horrifying period of the tribulation. It's like he's urging people to become medieval preppers. This might be the first preppers in all of literature. I don't know. But he, he goes further than this. The wars with the Antichrist and the, the pagans are going to prove absolutely decimating with gruesome injuries abounding and pilgrims having to go preach at faraway lands. There are going to be long journeys to wage spiritual war and sickness and it's all going to abound in this period of horrifying travail. Further, the coffers of the church and all the nobles are going to be looted during the social convulsions and warfare between the Antichrist and those righteous peasants and your pagan forces invading Europe. They're going to loot Europe of basically all of its treasure in terms of gold and silver. To heal the righteous warriors in combat with Antichrist and paganism, but also to obtain the gold and silver required to fund the construction of the upcoming utopian millennium. Following the defeat of that evil, John of Rupasitia turns to the art of alchemy. And those two concerns, the creation of healing elixirs, which can also greatly extend life along with the production of gold and silver, are at the heart of the two alchemical works that have come down to us, the Liber de Consideratione Quintae Essentiae and the Liber Lucis. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier, both of these texts have come down to us in a positively mangled mess of a manuscript tradition and printing tradition and authorship tradition. But the main contours of both of these texts can be roughly analyzed. So let's start with the much shorter work on the creation of gold and silver, the Liber Lucis. In effect, the text details to poor evangelicals, this is almost certainly his Franciscan brothers, the creation of the Philosopher's Stone, such that it could be used to create the funds necessary to both fund the wars and then rebuild the world after, well, the onslaught of the Antichrist. Following on other such Franciscan alchemists, such as Roger Bacon and Pseudo Law, and especially the alchemical writings of Arnold of Villanova, which it's funny because Thorndark thinks it's hilarious as a whole Franciscan tradition of making gold and silver, which I, I get that irony, Thorndike. 
this is like also like a who's who of medieval notable Catalans also, so go Catalonia. John sees the process of transmutation occurring in seven stages in the text with an eighth chapter dealing on the construction of an athenor, that is to say, an al special alchemical furnace. Following Islamic alchemy, whereby the metals are ratios of sulfur and silver, John provides, well, the secret immediately, like in the second chapter, the secret of what he means by philosophical sulfur. It's Roman vitriol, sulfuric acid. Saltpeter then is combined with that sulfuric acid along with some mercury, and then sublimated to produce a mercurial sublimate. This is probably the extremely toxic mercury chloride, white as snow as John has it. That substance is then mixed with aqua fortis or nitric acid, then heated for 12 hours before it's distilled, leaving behind a kind of blackened waste or feces. Further alchemical steps persist to introduce sol ammoniac, creating the spirit of mercury, along with compounds bearing terms like the invisible sulfur. This one's really interesting because it is very likely an extremely early example of chemical conservation, all of which is then calcined for eight to 12 days, dissolved into water, then subject to another distillation with a Bain-Marie process, known but not revealed by the great luminaries of historical alchemy, mythological alchemy, Geber, Hermes, the Rosarius, Ramon Lull, and Arlen de Villanova, along with other chemicals like the milk of the Virgin, which ultimately produces either a white stone for the production of silver or a red one for the production of gold. To project the metals to do the transmutation, to use the alchemical language, one introduces gold or silver into the philosopher's stone, into a crucible, the medicine as John has it, and then you pour the combined gold, silver, and the philosopher's stone onto base metals to transform them into gold and silver respectively. Now I'm really looking forward to the critical edition of the Libra Lucis that is being produced right now by Professor Pinchipe, where we'll finally get a diplomatic translation, a critical apparatus informed by our best understanding of the manuscript tradition, and equally informed. And this is what I love about his work equally informed by actually recreating John's processes in a lab to see what actually happens. Turns out, lots of cool surprises to be revealed. For instance, it was long thought that John was just an armchair alchemist. He didn't really do any of this alchemy because he was in prison. Professor Pinchpe shows that he's doing alchemy and he can even detect some things about the kind of equipment he's using. He's using a glass alembic. Check the conversation out. All in all, the Liber Lucis isn't an extraordinary alchemical textbook of the time, frankly. In fact, the processes, as much as we understand it, is frankly pretty stereotyped in both theory and practice for the 14th century. However, what is fascinating about it is, one, it's clearly addressed to pious Franciscans, who John thinks will make use of the text to generate the gold and silver as part of a larger understanding of the apocalypse. It's the apocalyptic context that makes this text so interesting. And in that spirit, too, it's interesting because as John informs us, he's going to try to lay out the process as clearly as possible. He's not going to hide behind all kinds of deck nomen and enigmatic language or mysterious oblique references to the mystery of the mysterious mystery of the mystery something something, only the true adepts of the secret art of the philosophers something something. Hermes Trismegistus for some reason, of course. He's not going to do all that to explain the long-held mystery of the Philosopher's Stone. Why? Why wouldn't he do it? Because the stakes are too high. The world's about to end. The, the Franciscan brothers need to learn this technology, and they need to learn it on the quick, because the forces of the Antichrist are literally at hand, and without the ability to produce gold and silver, it's truly going to be a disaster for the pious engaged in apocalyptic combat with satanic evil. You know, just that little sense of urgency here. The clarity of the Liber Lucis is born out of the threat of imminent looting of the entire Christian world by out of the forces of the pagans and the Antichrist. Remember, the Antichrist is already alive over there in China, as far as John's concerned, and the need to use alchemy to fund the rebuilding of the entire world. In that way, the text is extremely interesting in the history of alchemy. Now again, Professor Pinchipe and I are going to be talking about trying to restore the text as much as possible to its ur state or original condition using both close textual manuscript recension analysis, but also his amazing forensic chemistry 
to do so again and again, check out our episode on our conversation about that as a companion to this video. That said also, if you have some Latin, if you can read a little Latin, I'm going to include a scan of the edition from the Liber Lucis from my text of the Theatrum Chemicum, which is by no means the or text. But if you want to try your hand at learning to read and translate some historical alchemy, this is one of the absolutely best text precisely because of how clear it is. So if you want to try your hand at translating some alchemy, I'll leave the PDF of the Liber Lucis. Actually, it's, it's an edition that I own, but the scan I'll be having, it's from the edition owned by Carl Jung. You can look at Carl Jung's own hand owned his own collection of alchemical manuscripts and alchemical text here, his version of the Atrium Chemicum. So you'll literally be translating it from scans from the text that was owned by Jung. So that's kind of cool. And people think I just throw shade on Jung all the time. Jung was a freaking genius. He just was kind of wrong about historical alchemy. However, to survive the war with the Antichrist, John employs his philosophy of the cosmos, along with his skills as an alchemist, to compose one of the first texts of Latin alchemical medicine, what we would now call pharmacology. Indeed, this is hundreds of years prior to Paracelsus, who's often attributed with just that innovation. So John did it, did it first. In his De Quinta Ascentia, John takes up a point made actually by Roger Bacon just a little bit before him, that the natural condition of human beings is actually being healthy and living a very, very long life. Indeed, much longer than the life you normally now lead. Not that you would, uh, not that you would know that from uh, medieval times, but to prove this, Bacon turns to the Bible, because what else would he turn to? And shows that for hundreds of years before the flood, the lifespans of those pre-deluged people were extremely long and they only shortened through the ages. Thus, if it is our fallen nature and our sublunar position in the cosmos that subjects us to both generation and corruption, to use the language of Aristotle, perhaps there is some means through art, artifice, rather than just nature, that we might provide aid to our own nature, and thus heal sickness and old age brought about by nature. Thus, alchemy in this sense is not aimed at the production of gold or silver, but of health and life itself. But, but how? To understand this, we have to understand why we age, why we get sick, and why we eventually die, according to the Aristotelian-infused medieval Islamic medical theory inherited by the Europeans. First, our nature has fallen through sin, so there's just no chance at immortality prior to the resurrection and final redemption accomplished through Christ. So this ain't Chinese alchemy, you're not gonna live forever. You can get to be a long time, maybe a thousand years, but you're not gonna live forever. But life can be greatly extended in this understanding. Again, just like the super long lives of all those antediluvian figures of biblical mythology. Further, our physical bodies are also composed of four elements and their accompanying humors, the disharmony of which, by the way, is just illness. This is the classic Galenic humoral medicine taken up by folks like Ibn Sina that became the dominant medical tradition through the Middle Ages. Well, through the Middle Ages and almost until the completely modern period. It's amazing how long it took to die. Aging was just a specific function of the humoral theory, mostly by the body losing heat over time. This is why older people are typically cold. And the drying out of the body over time until natural death occurred. That's why natural mummies occurred deep within the earth. Now, the task of the doctor was to diagnose humoral imbalances and to correct them by changing things like diet, location, and, you know, purging, like bloodletting and emetics and stuff. And thus, they re-established health by reharmonizing the humors and the extended life. However, John felt like this was just a losing game, sort of a two steps back and only one step forward. Why? Because the cures given by contemporary doctors were themselves from the very natural world that tended toward disharmony. Thus, a true medicine had to be somehow hypernatural, not supernatural, but hypernatural above nature, and yet capable of harmonizing any defect within nature. And John found just that substance in Aristotle's analysis of the heavens. 
While beneath the moon, the world of change and decay, the four elements were in a constant seething flux. However, above the moon, a fifth essence ruled, one marked by eternality and perfection, one marked by circular movement and a fineness, a subtlety able to pass through virtually any substance. That fifth essence, Lilu Dallas Multipass, John argued could be harnessed as a kind of cure-all or panacea, which would perfectly balance out the complexion, to use the language of Galen, of any imbalanced humoral state, and thus cure beyond the power of mere nature, but also greatly extend life. But how could we get access to this pure, purifying aether, the fifth essence, given that it was confined to the region, well, above the moon? Recall that it's extremely subtle, and it actually flows in very small amounts down into our realm. In fact, it penetrates through all things, though we very rarely ever interact with it, much less harness it. It's like the ancient version of neutrinos or muons. It's very weakly interacting or something. But that taken, that's what causes things to come alive, and it's taken as proof that the fifth essence actually pervades all things in a subtle yet important manner. This Aristotelian idea would actually be developed by the Stoics as the fiery breath or divine logos permeating all reality. However, recent technological developments imported by European doctors at that time from the Islamic world had, according to John, finally unlocked the ability to harness the fifth element. It's like cutting edge tech being discovered right in time to deal with the mounting forces of the Antichrist. Remember, for John the Antichrist is already alive and just at the last minute they get the technology to, to, to use against him in the fight. Probably following upon the works of folks like Thaddeus Alderatus, a recent technology had discovered a substance that seems to be like all four elements at once and yet seems to transcend them in some ways. It was similar to water, but it could burn. It was like air, but it wasn't warm and humid. It was hot, but it wasn't like the cool dry earth, but it wasn't like fire either because it actually cured and cooled down fevers. It was wet, but it didn't produce melancholy when consumed, rather much the opposite. It burned when it was tasted, but it, was, it weirdly left the skin cool as it evaporated. This quintessence actually had cured John in his dungeon. One of his legs had become infected. The, the leg irons he was wearing caused a wound to fester. In fact, it became so infected with maggots he could cast them away by the handful, he says. He re requested the quintessence and he carefully poured the elixir over his wound and what should have been a mortal infection, at least requiring an amputation, it was miraculously healed. For John, the finest expression of the quintessence, the fifth supernal element, it was distilled alcohol, still known to this day as the water of life, eau de vie, whiskey, ishkiva, aqua vitae. Yep, the answer was booze. It sometimes is, until it shouldn't be, until it can't be. Now, the quintessence taken from the seven distillations of wine was thought of paragon importance for John. The quintessence was all diffused through every substance, although as well. In the first part of his De Quinta Essentia are just various modes by which to create the quintessence from everything from wine to human blood to organic materials and even minerals, especially gold. is actually very easy because it's already so pure. You simply anneal a pure gold Florentine florin and quench it in our aqua ardens and in strong alcohol. It's like gold schlager or some $97 cocktail in Manhattan. Another tincture, while not printed actually in my Theatrum Chemicum edition, but popular in the manuscript tradition, and one that clearly excited John, was the preparation of the quintessence with the use of iron-rich antimony, probably of Hungarian extraction. Most antimony now comes from China. This was steeped in a heated vinegar, which produces a very vibrant red color before being distilled. It also produces a poison, so that's ironic. Another formula for the so-called milk of virgins also employs extremely toxic mercury sublimate, probably mercurial chloride, similar to the substance, by the way, used in the production of the Philosopher's Stone in the Liber Lucis. 
and it seems to produce a caustic substance capable of perforating the hand with only a, a few drops. It's like liquid stigmata. Don't play with this stuff. With numerous descriptions of the preparation of the quintessence given, lots of versions of the quintessence given, the second part of the book is a kind of diagnostic medical text for treating numerous diseases and maladies. Basically almost every malady one can imagine from the Middle Ages. Leprosy, paralysis, itching, festering wounds, like Rupert Sishahab, what might be called mental illness today, such as melancholy or fantasy, various kinds of coughs, spasms, madness brought on by hallucinations and bad dreams, even cures for sore feet. Recall that part of what's going to happen here is there's going to be a bunch of wandering mendicant preachers, etc. They're going to have sore feet. It's a panacea. It cures everything. Just some versions of it work better than others. However, the chapter on the plague is surprisingly disconcerting. Recall that John's imprisoned throughout the period of 1348 to 1351 52 during the height of the plague. He himself actually contracted the plague in prison, but managed to survive. Tough as nails, that one. But you'll be surprised to learn that, there, 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 that there's no quintessential cure for the Black Death. It's a punishment from God. So you just got to pray and fast and stuff. What do you, it's the Middle Ages, what do you expect? Interestingly enough, there are cures against being bewitched, various forms of sorcery, and of course, of course, demonic possession. The use of the quintessence against demonic possession is curious because that's normally taken to be a kind of spiritual affliction, typically cured through spiritual means, typically through exorcisms. However, John points out that in the book of Tobit, there the angel Raphael extracts an essence, a quintessence, the angel Raphael's doing alchemy from the liver of a fish to drive away the demonic Asmodeus. How? Even demons are composed of fine, ethereal stuff, and they can be affected by these very powerful medicines. Many of these cures are also potentially amplified if they're prepared and taken at certain astrologically opp opportune times, but there's nothing really here of a very heavy-duty alchemical astrological theory at work in the text, but you do get, like, some astro astrology thrown in there. The text of De Quinta Ascentia would go on to a huge impact as it was accidentally incorporated into the extensive corpus of alchemical text associated with another Catalan mystic, Romando Lull, about 150 texts in the Lullian corpus, and without a doubt, this foundational text of pharmacology would go on to influence Brunschweig and Ulstaff and Ruff, and ultimately, Theophrastus Bombastus, the man, the myth, Paracelsus, who we typically give credit for the development of iatrochemistry or medical chemistry, medical pharmacology. In this way, the text in its various corruptions and transmissions and all of this mess, it punches way above its weight in both the history of alchemy and the history of medicine. But recall, the original text was composed in light because of, prompted by John's apocalypticism as a means to employ the secret medicine for the health of the soldiers of Christ against the dreadful forces of Antichrist that were so soon to appear. And you do get some sense of that urgency by reading the text. Now, we don't know the final fate of John of Ripposicia. I suspect that he was probably held under house arrest or even something like protective custody in Avignon, probably until his death. He was probably taken to be just as likely to be crazy as he, you know, a fantasticus, as he was declared, as a real prophet of God. And given further, I suspect that his alchemical expertise, which I do think was actual practical alchemical expertise, for reasons that Professor Principe will lay out in our conversation, I think they are hedging their bets. If those spiritual understandings of his were correct, if the world really was coming to an immediate end, then he'd be the kind of guy that you'd, you'd, you'd want on your team when the Antichrist did actually show up. I suspect he was something between a medieval David Koresh and a Robert Oppenheimer. Professor Principe's critical edition of the Liber Lucis will soon be appearing in Ambix, which is a fantastic journal, I believe, and will be well worth the wait. 
Until then, the best study of John of Rupestitia's Apocalyptic Alchemy is the wonderful text by Leah Devun, Prophecy, Alchemy, and the End of Time. Now, it can be a could be a little specialized, especially when it comes to assuming what you know about medieval history, but it's absolutely worth having for any enthusiast of the apocalyptic and the alchemical. Lynn Thorndike's Lynn Thorndike's entry on John remains pretty solid and can be found in volume three, hence why it's missing, of his history of magic and experimental science. He also includes some great bibliographical information on the manuscript situation, which I'll have to admit isn't totally up to date with scholarship, along with some primary texts from those manuscripts, though they're all, they're all in Latin, but he does give you some excerpts from them which are pretty cool. So, more on alchemy and apocalypticism to come. Until then, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.